How many of you all are uh, excited about heaven? Let me hear it. Excited about heaven? How many of y'all are excited you came one today? Oh, that's like equal. What's up? What's up with that? I mean, <laughs> but isn't that interesting that we can be sort of equally excited about the things of this world and yet the things of heaven? Uh, and yet they're totally different, but yet we need to experience life fully. But sometimes when we're not experiencing life fully, we really can't see heaven. Have you all experienced that? Like if you're having a hard time with life, it's hard to see God. It's hard to see heaven. Um, but yet God is a part of our lives. He's in and through and with us um, and even became one like us as a human being himself. And the powerful truth of his love is that he wants us to live the fullest life we can. But yet he knows that there's suffering. He knows that there's persecution. He knows that there's going to be difficulties in life. Amen? And so Jesus didn't come to save us from problems and pain. He just came to save us from our attachment to him. Amen? Uh, let me repeat that. That was hard. God didn't send his son to save us from pain of living on this earth. But he did come to save us from eternal hell and damnation. That is like the biggest truth about what happened in the first reading with the Maccabean sons. That they were trying to again be focused on the freedom to worship their God. But they were in a situation where... That God doesn't exist. That God don't count. That God don't matter. And what you need to do is worship the God of the king at that time. And to worship the king at that time meant you had to renounce and deny everything about your God. So imagine yourself in a land that's not your own. Imagine yourself in a situation where you weren't free to love how you called to love and especially love God who is love. Imagine that you could not follow the laws that you were tied to and bound to by the faith that you professed with that God of love. Now imagine that if you did not, if you tried to continue your worship, that you would be persecuted, punished, and ultimately if you did not renounce your own faith and ascribe to the God of that day and the God of the king, you would literally lose your life. Not that we time traveled and that's happening right now, but what would you do? What would you do if somebody from another religion said you can't worship the way in the religion of your belief, and by the way, if you dare do it, you will die? You now have to succumb and you have to become one of our religion's beliefs. And if you don't, you'll perish. If you can imagine that that's real, that was real time. That was the reality of the Maccabean sons and the mother of the Maccabean sons. And so you have this moment of great, great, great tension where should I believe any longer because my life will be taken from me or will I proceed and move forward as far as I can not renouncing my faith and believing in what the God who I believe in taught me? What would you do would you want to hold on to this life or would you be willing to give that life to God as a sacrifice? And that's what happened to the sons. And you sort of heard them like, you know, what a fiend you are to make us go in this direction where we don't believe what you believe. We understand who we are in our God. And all of a sudden you're losing your members of your body cut off in front of you. Your tongue cut off. You being horribly punished by watching your mother and your other brothers die in front of you. What would that be? Would you say, oh, whoa, 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 let me just, re I'm good, let me recant my faith. I don't know about that anymore. Woo, that was close. <laughs> or would you hold on? Would you take courage? Would you believe even when it doesn't feel good? In our culture, we believe because we feel good. And a lot of times if you're Catholic, you know, we want to have a lot of consolation. But sometimes in those consolations, those prayers, you're better to find God in the suffering than in the comfort. Can I get an amen? Like sometimes it's easier to think God's with me because everything's fine. When actually God is most revealed to you when things aren't going well. 
Do you know what I'm, what I'm saying? It's actually when you are suffering and you're tying your suffering to God, that is the place of true faith. It's not when I had three square meals, I got here in my own car, I got a job, I've got a house, people love me, I've got five likes today on my Instagram. <laughs> and we get so comfortable. That's deception. Real faith in what matters when we believe is when the going gets tough. When you don't have things lined up, when when things are not working out with your family, when things aren't working out in our country, when things aren't working out in our world, and things aren't working out in your own personal faith life. Those are the times when you and I are called to muster up those seeds of faith and ask the Lord to germinate and nutri give nutrients and, and give us forge fortify our faith seeds. Those are the times where we say, Lord, help me to sprout somewhere. Right now, I feel like I'm stuck in the ground. But if you can just touch my, touch me, Lord, so I can start to sprout some faith for real time. For real this time. And you know what's so beautiful, church of this millennial? That Jesus himself is so desirous of you to focus on him that he looks at you more than he looks at your sin. He loves you greater than your sin. Can I get an amen? In fact, he says you are amazing. And you've come through a long way and you might still have your nose dusty from some stuff you got going on. But I love you more than your sin and your weakness. I see my love in you and I'm inviting you to get back up and I will dust you off and I will embrace you and I want you to be more alive than you've been to yourself. Because a lot of times we get so stuck in our sinfulness, we forget about the greatness of God. We get so caught up in the minutia of, of the matters that are trivial, we forget about the triumph of the cross. A lot of times we get so fixated on our stuff, we almost become an idol itself. Jesus is calling you to let go of those idols. Let go of those egos. Tell your neighbor, say, let go of your ego. Ready, go. Let go of your ego. Because Jesus wants to do something more than you've allowed yourself. Because he loves you so much more than you do your sin. Sometimes we don't even know. You know what the biggest thing is? That, isn't that God can forgive us, right? Because he already died for every sin, right? Did y'all know that hashtag? Did you know that? <laughs> He already loves you more than your sin, and he died for all those sins. But the biggest question is, as he's forgiven you in the sacrament of reconciliation, as he even forgave you at the beginning of this Mass, when we say, Lord, have mercy, I confess to Almighty God. By the way, that was a part of absolution. They got a little baby absolution right there. The biggest thing is, will you follow Jesus even when you stop? Will you forgive yourself so you can move forward? Will you allow yourself to be forgiven by yourself who God already died for his, your sins through his son, Jesus Christ, so that you can love yourself like he loves you? Will you allow yourself to get back up again? You know, I sang it on All Saints Day. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. Cause a saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. And then that song keeps on going, get back up again, get back up again. And it's not so much that you, God is not surprised that you will sin probably this week. God will probably not be surprised. He'll be like, oh. How did that happen? He will not be surprised if you have a sin, a moment of sin this week. The biggest question is, will you believe in his love enough to get up again? Will you believe in his grace? Will you believe in his mercy? Will you believe in his forgiveness? Will you believe that he has his generosity and is greater than your generosity? And even if you're not generous with his mercy, that you would allow him to be generous through you. And forgive through you. I just want to encourage you. There was a, a skit at Lex Cat this week. And a lot of times I'm going to close with this image. 
Um, sometimes we lose our way. And we forget that Jesus is our aim. And the reality is, Jesus is right here. And then we have... And let's have another person. Hi, how are you? So you're going to stand up at the altar and face us. So go ahead. And you're going to be right here. It's going to be a, uh, maybe right here. All right. So say, for instance, you represent us. So... Uh, and you represent, unfortunately, but don't take it personal, but the pressures or temptations of the world, right? Not that you are. I know the last person was like, no! Right? But you're going to remind us that we all can be tempted. We all can fall short. I want you to go approach Jesus as you can. Ready to go. Hey, everybody, fall down, fall down. All right, I'm going to pull down. Let's pull down for you. Now, just to remind ourselves, any of you this week, and by the way, any of you right after Mass can fall short. Can I get an amen? Amen. And this is going to happen just by a little suggestion, a whisper, a thought, an addiction, some kind of area in your life that is weak that we haven't given fully to God. That's where Satan is. Satan didn't attack your strengths, amen? He attacks your weaknesses. So it's important to know yourself. Turn your neighbor and say, know yourself. Know yourself. Turn your neighbor and say, armor up. Armor up. All right, imagine that our sister, who is like you and me, did not armor up. She put on the helmet of salvation. She put on the breastplate of righteousness, but she forgot her shield of faith. Right? And so old scratch gives her a little whisper. And all of a sudden, he just gives her that whisper that suggests that. And you're going to just give her just a little bit of turn. And you're going to turn her that way. Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. Right there. Put it there. There, there you go. Okay, there you go. So imagine that moment happened. You go, right? And all of a sudden, remember, she had that clear direction, right? You saw that. She had clear experience. She could come to God with any time, any moment, any day, any part of the day. And she, she saw her, she approached Jesus with Rome, and she had that relationship. That suggestion was just a little turn, right? She didn't make her turn all the way 180, just a little 20, 20 degree. All right, now walk towards, walk your way that, in that direction. Okay, and then you're good right there. Is that towards Jesus, church? Yeah. How, is she getting closer to Jesus? Keep walking. Is she getting farther from Jesus? Whoa. Okay. At that very moment, Jesus is aware of that. But Jesus gives us free will, church. He gives you free will. He's not making you come to him, and he's not keeping you from him. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, so let's change it up. Change it up. You are going to be an inspiration. You're going to be a, a prayer warrior. You're going to be somebody who's a parent. You're going to be a friend. You're going to be maybe a stranger. But you're going to give this wonderful soul over here an encouragement. It's like, have you prayed lately? Have you, have you, do you know God loves you? And I want you to just give her that little whisper again but, and direct her towards the cross. Ready? Go. And now Todd will represent all of us again. All right. And turn her towards that little direction. Uh, this, this way. There you go. All right. Remember, free will. Love is not forced. It's free. But all of us can be a part of the body of Christ to encourage somebody, to be a helper. That's what St. Paul was telling the Thessalonians. You guys have done this. I love you guys. You can do this. And be encouraged by the things above. Don't get stuck in the things below. And here it is. He gave us, like you, a done this this week. You've encouraged somebody. You've listened to somebody. you helped somebody. You gave that little nudge. And here she goes towards our Lord. Let's thank God for that moment. Church, I just want you to know, Jesus is more interested in your love for him and his love for you than your sinfulness. Never think you begin with God, Lord, I'm a horrible sinner. First of all, begin, Lord, I'm your child. I need your grace. Help me to be the best son and daughter again. I forgot, or I was weak, but I just want you to know, I love you, 
And I'm sorry that I haven't loved you as best as I coulda, shoulda, woulda. But here I am, and I know I belong to you, not this world. Not this world, and not Satan for sure, Lord. Help me now to turn back to you. And at that very moment, you say, help me, Jesus. Right there is that very grace-filled moment where Jesus is bubbling up into your well of grace so that you can be refreshed in your spiritual life again. That you can be freed from the bondage that you may have unknowingly or unknowingly got yourself caught into. You see, Jesus came to save, not to make you stay in your sin. So focus on his love for you today. Focus on his mercy. And by the way, somebody else might need that same mercy from you. Parents, be merciful to your children. Children, be merciful to your parents. Siblings, be merciful to each other. All of us, employers, be merciful to your employees. You know, it's everywhere. We need the mercy of God, the love of God, more than ever before. And we are the first ones to condemn ourselves. Jesus didn't. He came to save you, not to condemn you. And he loves you more than your sin has got a hold of you. He loves you greater than your sin. So the question is, how many of y'all are excited about going to heaven? That's even better. Amen. <laughs>